Hello everyone, this is Yanis Kalkidis speaking. Uh, this is the um, next uh, uh, lecture on approaches to measuring performance regarding quality and patient safety. I would like to start our this presentation with a, an interesting uh, quote, let's say, excerpt. There are intangible realities which float near us formless, realities which no one has thought out and which are excluded for lack of interpreter. Although this excerpt by Natalie Barney was completely irrelevant to healthcare when it was written, I found it strikingly relevant. Let me tell you why. Isn't it intriguing, intriguing to know that there are intangible realities next to us, near us, that we have not clue about their existence, and even when we realize it, we are unable to interpret them? Isn't it the case in our own healthcare system? Does it remind you of what is happening in our every day in our healthcare organizations? Isn't it right that there is so much information around us that we do not use or we cannot interpret in a sensible and appropriate way so that they become precious knowledge? Our vital and urgent strategy, urgent strategy is to exploit any possible piece of information, to measure it, and interpret it in the most effective way we can. The sooner, the better. Well, let's start from our fallacies, our mistakes, because this is where we should focus and intervene. We are talking about intervention, and it includes all types of interventions in the healthcare sector, clinical and non-clinical. So, what are our commonest errors? According to Bass and Gold taxonomy, there are a number of errors. I think that we should focus uh, on the first three types of error, which are the wrong conclusion that an intervention has achieved significant change when it has actually failed to do so. This is the type one. Type two is that when the wrong conclusion that an intervention has failed to have a significant effect when it actually has done so, very pity of course, and judging that an intervention has failed when it was so poorly designed that it could not have achieved the desired effect anyway. Trying to detect chains so that we'll measure it. A major challenge that we face is to identify any change attributable to the intervention from the background noise of other changes and trends that concurrently take place. This is one of the biggest headaches that we face, both on the scientific level or the everyday managerial level. Given the plethora of factors which affect the endpoint in the delivery of health services at clinical as well as organizational level, any change due to a particular intervention is likely to be small, difficult to detect, and indeed may not appear and become evident for quite some time. Please remember this before you become frustrated when you cannot demonstrate a good outcome of a well-designed intervention in your organization, and this happens, I promise you, very, very often. This can be particularly problematic for small-scale interventions with insufficient power to reveal a statistically significant difference, even when they achieve a change that practitioners, clinicians or non-clinicians might agree is a meaningful change especially because most probably your effort falls into this category, the small scale intervention, you have to be aware of this danger. And just a note for clarification to make sure that we all speak the same language and we have the same terminology. Effectiveness is used to refer to achievements under normal conditions, whereas efficacy refers to effectiveness under ide ideal conditions. Our effort, though, to avoid type 3 error, which means that we are trying to, to, to do our best to be close to the ideal condition by ensuring that interventions are delivered in the ideal form, this is what I mean, limit the generalizability of our findings, which is, it has its pros and cons. We can discuss about it. But the worst, though, is the frustration that you feel, you may feel, thinking that you lag behind from the excellent results of the same intervention but under ideal conditions that happen uh, somewhere else and they publish their results. 
In other words, your effectiveness is much worse than the published in scientific journals efficacy. But this is meant to be like that. By definition, efficacy is always, because it's under ideal condition, uh, than effective. So be very cool about it. How can we objectively define a measurable quality? Well, we say compliance with or adherence to standards. But there is a hidden assumption here. The quality can be adequately, if not completely measured. This is the assumption, that the quality can be measured. But this last one is not at all self-implied, in many cases. And to make it even more complicated, we can also add to this measured in which organizational setting and during which specific time period to measure the specific, the, the needed, let's say, uh, compliance. And when this measurement, let's say, can happen, once first, once clinical practitioners define the standards of care under which they can comfortably practice, and second, the healthcare field acknowledges their applicability. Again, don't forget the microenvironment applicability to its environment. This is not at all self-implied. And now about the measurement. The headache is not so much regarding the measurement, about the concept of measurement, but the actual work to deal with all those small, seemingly unimportant details, but still so horrible to identify and to tackle effectively. There are a couple of ways to measure clinical performance, which may mean that none of those ways is really the unique one that will give us all answers. What, we, what ways do we have to measure clinical performance? With one way, we can reach to an indication of the level of performance. With another one, we can measure it all. In the first approach, we need a representative or key sample of all the tasks that we perform. In the second approach, we use analytics, let's say the modern analytics, IT, informatics, and so on. But in both cases, we need to compare results to pre-agreed standards. And this interpretation is as important as the measurement itself. Everyone knows the quote, you are not managing if you are not measuring. But there are so many devilish details that can completely invalidate or cancel the truth of this saying because of course you are not managing if you are not measuring but also you are not managing if you are measuring wrongly obviously yeah? or you are not managing if you are only measuring as it happens quite often because they have the, the policy to measure things and then they are measuring and everything is going into the drawers and nothing happens so how can you manage if you are not using what you measured or if you have wrongly measured and take, obviously, the, the wrong decisions based on this. I would like to talk about our mistakes and errors because this is what we are, uh, we are facing every, every day in our practice. But the question is, and you will see in the next slide why I'm asking this, should we try to make the measurable important or the important measurable? Be very cautious. The road way to measure is not a highway and quite often it is a very slippery road. Danger for accident is always lurking somewhere there. So let's see now what are the different categories of fallacies that we encounter in our everyday practices. Uh, these of course are not so obvious as they are described here, but in reality this is what is happening. So the first one is that what it happens and what is the fallacy is that we are trying to measure whatever can be easily measured. Okay, that's okay as far as it goes, but this is not the point. The second fallacy is that to disregard or give an arbitrary value whatever cannot easily be measured. So this is an artificial and misleading attitude, uh, which of course, because of this, is not advisable. The third fallacy is to presume that whatever cannot easily be measured isn't so important. This is blindness, simply. And finally, the worst of all, what we cannot easily be measured really does not exist, which is a suicide. 
there are two main methodological concepts for performance measurement. One is the concept of indicators, and the other is the concept of utilization management. In modern healthcare delivery, analytics are and will increasingly going to be introduced to monitor and measure clinical governance. Maybe this discussion about indicators and utilization management will be obsolete in sometimes, not far away from now, but we'll have the chance to discuss this very controversial issue in September, hopefully. You know, when everyone knows that we all talk about clinical standards. Standards, what are the standards? Clinical guidelines, clinical protocols, critical paths, pathways. In parallel, we also talk about clinical indicators. But underneath all the above approaches uh, of, and standards is the goal to improve clinical practice. Either showing the way and compare your performance in advance of your clinical practice or afterwards, retrospectively, the point is the same, to improve clinical practice. The use of clinical pathways or critical paths or roadmaps, there are many way to express the same thing in terms of terminology, is currently maybe the most sophisticated clinical methodology to guide and monitor everyday clinical practice. It is a way to measure clinical performance having right from the beginning pushed and channeled clinicians' practice towards compliance to pre-agreed guidelines. So somehow critical pathways is a kind of hybrid of clinical management on one side and measurement tool on the other. On the other hand, clinical indicators is a more clear-cut methodology and surely a, poor, a pure, solid tool to simply measure clinical performance. That's a well-known and widely used methodology which works in uh, most of the cases. So, are clinical indicators really good? The answer, in my humble opinion is yes and no. Can we do our job with them? Yes and no. Maybe mostly yes, but there are also quite a few uh, shortcomings. So let's see epigrammatically what they can do for us, the indicators, at least in theory. One is information about quality and appropriateness of care. Another thing is that it, they can be used as a basis for policy making, is also to monitor performance for funding bodies, to empower consumers for informed decision making, and to provide the basis for financial incentives related to selected service parameters. So what's the objective? The multiple objectives of clinical indicators are listed in the following two slides. And as you can see, they cover a wide range of clinicians and managers' expectations. For example, they can, the objectives can be to identify inefficient inappropriate or inappropriate use of services, which is extremely important, to predict preventable events, as you can see, you can read, score patients based on a comprehensive risk profile, identify disproportionately high utilizers of care across the system, to analyze and design bundled care, to detect and interpret non-standard performance, to profile providers and practices, to leverage full spectrum data, and to provide research and study analytics. So I think we can agree that all those objectives look great, but in reality, there might be some issues that need to be taken care in order to, to really maximize their effectiveness. Well, there is nothing purely good in life. So what about our clinical indicators that we have seen so many advantages that they have? What are the problems that we face? So the potential adverse effects by using indicators could be a number of things. I will just mention only a few. They may end up rewarding status quo for reasons that we can discuss, but maybe you already experienced that or 
they may have adverse effects on a team on, on teamwork or very well known issue scheming of patients or gaming of the healthcare system in order to Im improve the, the, um, uh, the indicators and uh, also uh, no provision of valid and reliable picture of the healthcare service. So let's see why is that? Because indicators may not consistently be collected and reported, not being or at least partially clinically meaningful not covering the full range of health healthcare settings so that to assess the delivery system as a whole or not easy to collect them in all organizations. Those are some of the reasons. There are many more depending on each case, but those mentioned about are the most frequently encountered in healthcare organizations nowadays. And I'm sure that everyone of you have encountered this type of uh, uh, problems. In the following, you can find a practical, I think also a useful guide on how to proceed for an effective use of indicators, clinical or non-clinical. You can add to this list, to this, uh, you can enrich uh, the content of those steps, but I think that those are the basics in the process and they have been proved really useful. Uh, that's why it is advisable not to be omitted. So step one, identify the problem. It can be disease group based, patient group based. That means from the perspective uh, we're trying to identify and to find a disease problem, a patient problem, a treatment modality, a treatment modality, which means the different departments, they are using different modalities of treatment for the same thing. So this can be the perspective of this one, the organization based, generic problems, professional based because some um, uh, professionals need to find out uh, what is their own issue. So there are different perspectives, which are all of them um, um, should be taken into account. Step two, identify the perspective from which to measure. It's the patient perspective medical or clinician perspective, administrator, policymaker, funding body, and so on. It is important to know the perspective because this is the way you should better choose the right indicator. Step three is to focus on transition points. It's a huge issue. Uh, simply pay attention at the boundaries of interfaces between sectors and models of care. So indicators should be suitable to evaluate shared care and care interfaces and not only a, 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 a rather narrow departmental, let's say, problem, which is also good, but it doesn't give the whole picture uh, of uh, what we are looking for. Step four. Step four is to identify the indicator. As you know, indicators can be um, of different types like structural, process, outcome, and so on starting from structural indicators, there are qualitative information about innate characteristics of the system. So this is the first type of indicator category. A continuation of the same step is to identify, as we said, indicator in case there are process indicators. So quantitative information about compliance with evidence-based treatment and process of care is uh, what we are um, uh, having in mind when we are talking about the process. For example, if appropriate medication is given to the right pace. What are the, what are the advantages of process indicators? They provide clear and interpretable feedback about care. Point the way to remedial action, because as long as you know what went wrong, you know what you are doing can be collected quickly and often are quite sensitive to differences in quality of care. Staying 
continuing to be at step four and trying to identify an indicator, we may need to use outcome indicators. They usually measure very important parameters of, of the delivery of care, like mortality, morbidity, harm from healthcare, health status, health-related quality of life, satisfaction with the quality of care. There are some crucial issues in liaison indicators and, um, and they have to do with some uh, uh, main questions, uh, scientific questions like to which extent we can benchmark outcomes. Uh, the answer to this uh, can completely change our uh, strategy and our management. Uh, another question is, can we correlate structure and processes to outcomes? I mean, if, if the outcome is not good, uh, to which extent we can blame uh, the structure or the process for that or the other way. And, and based on that, uh, how useful it could be to combine the different types of indicators and try to make a, a, a compact, let's say, indicator including both structure and process or process and outcome and so on. All these are extremely important issues and they have an answer which can be very useful for uh, clinicians and managers. Step five. Step five is to prioritize indicator selection and action. You will not have one choice when you are saying, okay, I want to measure this, I know the problem and all the perspective and all this stuff. We have, you will have two or three, how you are going to prioritize them. You cannot use them all, so we should be very cautious about it. Using indicators for accountability purposes, especially if they are linked to financial incentives, may result in unintended and unfortunately sometimes intended distortion of care rendered. We can use a number of examples and um, you will see that in all cases we have to be very cautious because the results are very, very unfavorable. So whatever we have in mind, whatever are the, our priorities, perspectives, indicators must have strong clinical or empirical rationale for their use, be capable of measuring differences in standards of care, be easily understood by the users, be capable of taking into account differences of the patient's case mix. Be relevant to policy and practice, potential to foster real quality improvement. Be feasible to collect in a reasonable time frame and a reasonable cost in relation to its value and to comply with national data definitions. So, so, having very uh, briefly discussed all these about indicators, let's see now how can we weigh our needs, because we are trying to select indicators, maybe we have to, to see also what are our needs and to make sure that they are uh, really in accordance with uh, our selection. So prioritization, as, we, as we've said before, for selection of indicators can be decided on the basis of the perspectives purposes, organizational factors, and special interests, as well as methodological and technical characteristics that we have already been mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned before. However, the specific weight to each of those parameters remains a very individualized issue for each healthcare organization, and although complex is quite feasible and surely a sine qua non action that should be taken. I would like to uh, stress as much as possible that Choosing indicators based on needs, um, uh, perspectives, purposes, and so on, it's a very individualized issue for each healthcare organization. It needs an analysis at the level of the department of the organization, but it cannot be transplanted from one side to the other. If we do this blindly and we take the indicators that they are used everywhere and just change in, put it in different organizations, we will make a mistake somewhere. Either in the, in the right choice, we will miss a problem, we will try to 
we will focus on a minor problem as long as other problems are even well. So individualization in each, for each healthcare organization is extremely important in using indicators. And of course, step six, we have to test the indicator as well. We, we've chosen it, we've implemented it. It is imperative to test for measurability, usefulness, validity, reliability, feasibility, and acceptability. All this should not be done as long as you have a fully fledged um, indicator application, application of an indicator. It has to be piloted first to, to test all these uh, parameters that I've just mentioned, and then you apply it in a fully fledged motion, mode. And uh, some additional guiding principles for selection of indicators, I have listed six of them. Please make a, a note on the red ones which says not impose undue burden to staff extremely important as you know and to imp and the point is to improve performance these two are ex is of crucial importance and uh, they have to be and they deserve a special attention and and something quite tricky, I would say. This is the hierarchy of the four sets of criteria for evaluating measures. Important, scientifically acceptable, usable, and feasible. And let's see how it works, because the hierarchy that it was mentioned in the four points before, really matters. Because if it is not important, which was the first point, all else is meaningless. If it is not scientifically acceptable, which was the second, the results may be at risk for improper interpretation. If it is not interpretable and, use and usable, we don't care if it is feasible. And if it is not feasible, all the above are pointless. In such a case, we may need to look for alternative approaches to get the information that we need. We all need some time to crystallize the wealth of information that's available around measurement of clinical performance. That is one of the most crucial ones in the healthcare sector. However, we do need first to consider all this information, to interact, to delve into it, and eventually develop a more documented and informed opinion about their use. So thank you and see you soon.